Well, good afternoon and welcome to our first annual Claremont Garden History Lecture Series. We're very, very happy to have so many of you uh, come and join us today because we think this will be a, a wonderful talk. My name is Alice Stanley Durvin and I'm the principal here at Claremont Fancourt School. If you've had the opportunity to look around the house and grounds a little bit, I'm sure you'll agree that it is a wonderful, wonderful blessing for every one of us who work here and for the children who go to school here to um, just experience this, this environment every single day. We are all very aware that having this wonderful site brings with it the responsibility also to care for the house and the gardens. And our school is very, very much committed to making sure that we retain and restore and improve in keeping with the site. Um, so we've, we've done lots of work on it and will continue. You can see from the lines here that we're in the process of restoring this building, this room, um, to its, its grandeur. Um, we're also very committed to learning about our site because that's one of the ways, of course, that we improve and, um, and take care of it. And so we have the opportunity today to do just that. We're going to learn about historic gardens. I'd like to introduce David Regal. David and his wife, Barbara, have been the main organizers of this event, and we greatly appreciate their love for the school and their interest in historic gardens. And then David will introduce our speaker. Well, isn't this something? Um, you, uh, many of you probably have gotten an email from me, and I really appreciate seeing you here today. Um, welcome to what we hope to be at least an annual lecture on garden history. Um, Claremont, what a, what a place for us to sort of center ourselves as we carry on this conversation that we're hoping to have. And, and I think it, uh, how, this is just what I had in mind. Just what I had in mind. Um, you, some of you already know Professor Mole uh, of the University of Bristol. He's a popular and prolific author and speaker, well known to both garden history scholars and the public. His, un although garden history scholars often are part of the public. His ongoing project, Historic Gardens of England, supported by grants from the Levin Hume Trust is modeled after Sir Nicholas Pevner's Buildings of England. Upon completion, the nationwide project will present historic landscapes and gardens in separate texts, county by county. Ten books have already been published to date. Professor Mole is an engaging speaker with a long-standing interest in the cultural context of designed landscapes, the people who designed and lived in what are now considered historic buildings and gardens. We have a, afterwards, uh, uh, after uh, Professor Moll's talk, uh, we'll have a question and answer session, and we hope it's as lively as we can make it, okay? Um, to keep thoughts, though, clear, I'm going to pass these cards around for you to make notes on, and if you'd like, write out questions, and then during the Q&A, we'll have them passed up, okay? Now, you must be very careful with your questions because we're being videoed, all right? And I shall have to be very careful with my language, won't I? Um, particularly as quite a few people in the audience have either been taught by me or are being taught by me, and it's lovely to see them. Um, but it's a great privilege for me to be here at Claremont um, in a county that I haven't yet managed to deal with, although Jill Leggett's here in the audience, and we'll probably have a talk about things I could do in Surrey when I'm uh, finished the 34 others or the 33 others. Um, one of the big problems about this Levy Hume project that I'm doing is that um, I started far too late. Uh, Pevsner started in the 51, I think, and he finished England um, in 1974 with Staffordshire. But then, you know, he spent about six weeks doing each book in the first ones and I tend to spend about six or seven months doing each of mine. But now I'm very fortunate in that I have people to work with me, uh, funded by the Leverhulme, um, and so we're doing it a bit quicker, but not as quickly as I might like. Um, at the moment, I've got two books to write before Christmas, and 
teaching and everything. But that's great. That's what one wants to do. But this is, um, in true Blue Peter fashion, this is one I did earlier um, on um, William Kent. Um, it's brilliant, isn't it, doing uh, a biography of someone that you rather despise in many ways, um, or at least you think is a bit of a drunkard, um, not a terribly good architect, but quite a clever and intelligent gardener. Um, I'd done a couple of biographies before, one on Horace Walpole and one on William Beckford. Um, Walpole, um, I really disliked, uh, even though he was really quite an exciting um, commentator on the 18th century. But he was so, so bitchy. I mean, really bitchy bachelor. Um, and then, of course, I had Beckford. And, of course, Beckford was an absolute liar. He actually suggested that he'd done quite a lot of Mozart's little arias. And I wanted to call the book Composing for Mozart. A Life of William Beckford, and of course the publisher wouldn't allow that. It had to be A Life of William Beckford, composing for Mozart. But you know non puis and dry, don't you? Da, 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 da. Beckford claimed he'd actually done that and not Mozart, but there we are. Um, with William Kent, it's quite difficult to pin him down. It's not difficult to pin him down in terms of landscape gardening, which is what we're here to look at today, but it's very difficult to pin him down in terms of his character because he left very few letters, and those letters that we have got are generally begging for money from Italy. Um, so it's very, very difficult to get his character um, dealt with. Anyway, let's, yeah. Um, some of the slides in this presentation have got uh, quotes, which I will read out. Not all of them have, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, this is William Kent by Benedetto Luti, very heavy, jowly Kent, still in Italy in 1718 before he comes back to England. Um, and I love this Thomas Robinson quote. Robinson, nasty piece of work. Um, Yorkshireman, uh, dangerous person, Robinson. The signor, as he was called, often gave his orders when he was full of claret, which from the context could hardly have been at the dinner table, and suggest therefore an all-day intake of alcohol. And he did not, perhaps, see the work for several months after. He had, indeed, a pretty concise, though arbitrary, manner to set all right. For he would order, without consulting his employers, three or four hundred pounds of work or more to be pulled down and then correct the plan and bring it to what it ought to have been at first. And this is absolutely typical of Kent. He's drunk a lot of the time. He's not quite sure in terms of architecture what he's doing and then goes into a fit of peak and wants to rebuild things. Um, we ought to give you a little bit about his history first. Um, one of the best books to have been written in the last 10 years is by Fiona McCarthy, and that's the biography of William Morris. I don't know if any of you have read it. Um, and the first thing that she says in that book, which is very much what I believe in, she says that you have to go to places to find the people. And I've had a wonderful tour of the house here with Pamela, um, thinking about all the people that have been in this house and have made this house what it is. Um, and so I thought, I've got to go to Bridlington. I'm going to switch sides, and I'll come back to you, don't worry. Um, but I like switching sides. Uh, oh, yes, coalition government, isn't it? Um, and I thought, I'm going to have a fun time in Bridlington. This is what research should be. And I am going to stay over, and I'll have a lovely time. So anyway, I go to Bridlington thinking, it's a lovely place on the East Riding Coast, and I'll have a great time. It's an absolute hellhole. Have you ever been to Bridlington? Goodness me. I've never seen so many shell suits in my life. Oh, dear. But Bridlington Old Town is wonderful. And that, of course, is where... William Kent grew up. His father, William Kant, C-A-N-T, um, lived in Bridlington Old Town. And this is where he probably went to school, at the Bale, on the left at the Priory Church. And on the right, sorry, the left is the gatehouse of the Bale, where the grammar school was. And on the right is the Priory Church, where I think Kent might have got an inkling of the Gothic. Now, of course, the title of my lecture tonight is Subverting the Palladian the Gothic urge, the, the eclectic urge. Um, and there are real heroes tonight and real villains. And one of the main villains tonight is Lord Burlington. And we'll come more to that. He's the guy that created a Palladian straitjacket for Kent that Kent was trying desperately to burst out of most of his life. 
Anyway, oh, I've got to go over here, haven't I? Because it won't work unless I do that. Yeah. So off I go to old, old Town. I go to Bridlington, and I find this rather interesting late 17th century facade on one of the earlier houses. Um, and if you forget everything you hear tonight, don't forget this. Always trespass and always go round the back of buildings because that's where you find excitements. So I went round the back of this building through a little alleyway and I found the date stone that his father had put up. Can you see it's W-E, C-W-E and a little heart. And that's William Canton, his wife, and a heart to show how together they were that he had done this facade in the 1690s. And then I looked down, and looking down, I saw this in the courtyard. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that's Kent. Now, you see, the whole point about being a biographer is you have to capture your subject. And I found it very difficult to capture Kent because of all of these rather odd letters that were written in bits of Italian and bits of English. Um, he, he had terrible dyslexia. There's no doubt about it, he was dyslexic. Um, and I looked at this, and a woman came out of the door, and she said, ooh, you like my gnome then, do you? And I said, yes, it's a wonderful gnome. And I said, it reminds me of William Kent. And she said, well, who's he then? I said, well, he lived in your house. Oh, did he? That man Kant? And I said, yes. I said, but when he went to London, he felt he had to be a little bit hoity-toity, and so changed his name to Kent. Oh, right. So we had this lovely chat. And then I started to look at William Kent's staffage. And there was the key to the man's mind. You only had to look at these wonderful drawings, most of them done in sepia, as you can see, for the garden buildings that he was designing for various people. On your right is um, one of the Chiswick designs for the obelisk and the gate in, in the gardens at Chiswick. And if you look very carefully, you can see that there is a man that's lolling in a drunken stupor, because of course it's midnight, and he has a pallet by him, and there are rabbits dancing in a circle. That's Kent, okay? Are you getting him? It gets better. Watch this. This is more Kent Staffage. It's great to have it up here. You can all see it, can't you? Who's got the popcorn? <laughs> On your top left, it's, you've got to work out who he is. And, of course, nobody had actually worked out, until I did this, this book, who Kent was in all these drawings. And, of course, the thing that's the giveaway is the staff. So Kent is always the man with the staff. So on your top left, you have Kent with his staff talking to one of the noblemen, which, of course, would be Burlington. And there is a little lapdog pissing on Burlington's ankle. Can you see that? And then on the right, there's Kent, just done a bit of designing in the garden, and he's taking a relief against the wall, and so is the dog taking a relief, <laughs> cocking his leg. And then who would actually design a cold bath? Of course, we've seen this fantastic cold bath here, the plunge bath. Who would design a cold bath in, in, the, in the terms of um, a Roman pantheon, which you can't see just out of shot, and actually have semi-naked men lolling about as if they're in some calidarium or frigidarium. And then on the right is the most important of all, Kent's staffage. And that is, as you can see, a satire kissing a shepherdess hand. Remember that. There'll be a test, OK? You're doing Q&A. I'm doing a test. Now, 